Full disclosure, I'm a digital and video conference marketing nerd, and I had the honor to go to about 15 different healthcare, life science, med tech, and genetics and genomics conferences last year, and was able to pull away with some major trends that I think is going to impact 2024. So as you go into your planning and your initiatives for your conferences this year, Kelly and I are going to nerd out and go down the rabbit hole specifically on digital and video opportunities that you can help amplify what you're doing on conferences. And specifically, we're going to showcase five different video opportunities. And then we've got three digital opportunities. And to us, these were definitely unique. It's not the usual suspect. So if this video, as you watch it, has been helpful, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. And without further ado, let's get into it. I had the honor to go to about 15 different conferences, whether it's life science, med tech, genetics, genomics, um, IT, software, healthcare related, a uh, variety of different conferences, obviously for last year. And it was kind of interesting, like some conferences were rock stars, like the ASCOs, the AACRs, like huge attendance numbers, right? Everybody showing up, great vibe, great attitude, obviously. But then there's some other ones that were kind of hit or miss, right? Some of the conferences just didn't have the attendance numbers. There weren't booths that were sold out. Sponsor presentations weren't sold out. So, you know, it really made me think, and I know we strategize about this for a lot of different clients too, is what are some other tactics if you decide to not go to certain trade shows? We definitely want to spend some time on that during our live session here today, but um, in unpacking uh, different alternative ways because everybody's maximizes, maximizing their conferences, right, Kelly? So just like when we plan out our conferences for this year, we're looking back historically at last year. We're looking back at the numbers. We're looking back at the metrics to say, hey, what was successful, what wasn't? And we know a lot of our clients and obviously they're doing the same thing too, right? They're really trying to figure out which events drove the most results. Where do they need to optimize this year? Where do they, where do they need to maybe think about doing some different tactics? And that's really what we're going to talk about um, here during this, this session. Um, but you know, without further ado, let's definitely get into it, Kelly. Um, and a lot of our clients, as I was mentioning, go to a lot of these different conferences, like the big marquee ones, obviously like AACR, um, ASCO. Another conference that's coming up pretty quickly too is, is HIMS. But honestly, any of these tactics and strategies that we discuss today can be leveraged for any conference, any trade show, right? It's kind of across the board. So Kelly and I are going to break down the first three digital conference marketing trends. And then we're going to talk, discuss about those three. And then for the last five uh, trends for 2024, it's going to be more specifically video related. So if you're watching live right now, and let's say your goal is to you know, work through the conferences and try to be more strategic with video, hold on, like we're going to get to those five, but let's jump into the first three when it comes to digital. And specifically the first one, um, it's a tactic that we've been leveraging for actually many years now. And you may be familiar with it if you're watching this. Um, it's called geofencing. It's also called event fencing. And it's one of those strategies, again, Kelly and I were talking about this before the call too, and, and last week when we were putting this together, uh, this is a great opportunity to stand out, even if you're not having a booth, even if you don't have a presentation, let's say you decided to optimize your conferences this year and you're like, Hey, yeah, I'm not going to go to a couple of these. What other tactics that we can do to actually have some sort of presence and digital geofencing is a great way to do it because essentially the way it works is it's a location-based service. So let's say, for example, you decided, you know, for whatever reason, uh, that maybe SABCS is just not a conference you wanted to go to this year. You wanted to optimize it and say, hey, how do we have a presence there uh, without having a booth? So we'll put a virtual fence around Henry B. Gonzalez, that convention center. And then the virtual fence, anybody that walks through as an attendee based on their mobile ID, and it's all anonymous. All we know is that mobile ID is within 30 feet. As long as you have your uh, location-based services opened, which 95% of people do because they're trying to get the weather right in that city, they're trying to get an Uber. Um, so as long as they go through that virtual fence, um, based on longitude and latitude, we can serve a banner ad specifically to that attendee. And it's a great way to stand out digitally as they consume media online, just like you and me. Um, think of about like lifestyle sites. So sports, news, weather, finance, any of those different lifestyle sites, you're going to see a banner ad, right? That talks about your solution, your product, and you're creating that, like that digital exposure that's much more cost effective than saying, obviously spending for a booth, traveling there, obviously hotel travel expenses, all those other things. So it's a real cost effective way um, to stand out. 
Kelly, what are your thoughts on geofencing and, and what, what have you seen um, good and bad about the geofencing tactic? Yeah, I think most uh, marketers uh, are, are aware of um, geofencing and event fencing. Um, but I think where the rubber hits the road and really allows a marketer to be able to really maximize um, their conference marketing budgets is there's always going to be, as you kind of touched on, one or two uh, conferences that you're kind of on the fence. Is it worth really going and spending fifty to hundred thousand dollars to be there with your crew, with with your team, uh, with an exhibitor booth? And many times that answer is no. I can't. I can't do it all. However, this is a great way for very little money to be able to still have a presence there, both. Um, at and during the conference with um, you know obviously ads that are being served across platform but even probably the more important part here is the fact that you then can go ahead and continue to serve those ads to people who clicked on your uh, on your ads and then continue to do kind of a post conference type of conversion um, it's really a really smart way to really maximize that, that those marketing budgets and by the way Jason I kind of think we're gonna have to come up with a, a new nickname for you I'm thinking conference whisper conference warrior i mean 10 to 15 conferences you're kind of up in the big leagues for that so i'm, I'm we're gonna have to do a name change i think on your title yeah i'm down for that kelly like uh, you know i introduced myself to a lot of uh, clients and prospects like i'm kind of a conference digital marketing nerd when it comes to conferences so uh that's not the best like title but definitely nerdy about whisper. conferences. yeah whisper. whisper that's a little that's conference better marketing whisper. term i like conference that marketing like. whisper it just rolls yeah. off the tongue yeah, maybe I should get a T-shirt that has that on there. So, um, but yeah, no. And you mentioned a great point that I wanted to highlight here too, Kelly, is the post-conference follow-up. Right, thirty days afterwards, everybody knows the attendees. It's like I call it like a paralysis analysis because there's so many things going on during the conference meetings and dinners and lunches and breakfasts, and you're going to like all these different poster presentations and you know sponsor presentations, and you leave there and it's kind of like. Uh, I only retained about 20% of the conversations that I had, right? So post this post-conference digital campaign kind of helps reinforce the things that you're discussing at these conferences. And I think it's a great tactic um, to do that post-conference follow-up uh, for 30 days, right? So it's a great, good time window to continue to follow up and nurture that prospect um, that's obviously clicked on your ad. And that's the only way that they can get in that post-conference follow-up, those 30 days retargeting is they have to see your ad. Obviously they have to click on it, right? Once they do that, now they're in the retargeting pool. So they definitely have obviously seen your brand, they've seen your solution, seen your product, obviously. So it's a great way to reinforce it 30 days after. And what I love about this tactic too, is a lot of our conference are, you know, global. So uh, in some cases they ask us, Hey, could you, do you, can you do like this digital geofencing event fencing in like, uh, countries like Spain and, and, you know, obviously in Europe. And, and I'm like, yes, absolutely. As long as we have a longitude and latitude, we can definitely do it at conferences like ESMO. So for example, let's say you don't want to spend the, the money to go international and you're like, Hey, I still want a presence. Well, I think that's a great opportunity to do international because we could definitely do international fencing. So it's a great opportunity, obviously. Um, moving on, let's get into the number two digital conference marketing trend. And we've all heard about this. We've all seen it. We've all done it. And uh, it's QR codes, right? Not a shocker. Um, not a surprise, obviously. And I'm continuing to see QR codes pop up more and more um, last year. And I think it's definitely going to continue this year. Uh, a lot of people just don't like to talk to salespeople, right? So what's the alternative? Well, if they come up to your booth, they don't want to, you know, like, you know, talk to the salesperson, right? They can scan your QR code. I've seen a lot of conferences have that code, um, the QR code specifically like embedded in their actual booth design. So anybody that's walking by casually, all of a sudden, if they're like, hey, this has kind of piqued my interest. I definitely want to learn more. So they can do the QR code. They can drive either back to a landing page or back to your website. Um, I've done it several times and a couple of times I've, a video's popped up, right? That's either their CEO or maybe it's a KOL that's talking about their solution. So it's definitely a great way to interact with a company without having to do like, you know, talk to the salesperson, right? And it's weird. I've, I've seen it executed really at the highest level, like I was mentioning, like in the actual booth, but I've seen it executed pretty poorly too, where it's on a banner, like it's got, it's going up the escalator and you're trying to grab the QR code as you're kind of going up and you're like, like, yeah, that's not a good tactic, right? But uh, Kelly, have you noticed a lot of QR codes too? Yeah, it's odd. It's I guess we can file this under what was once old is now new because we all remember QR codes 
years ago and thinking losers. I mean, that that's not popular. And now it's come back into popularity. And it's also, I think, being used more effectively than it was when it was first introduced. But yeah, I think it's a, a really great way to get good detailed information quickly into someone's hands. Yeah. And I, people are going paperless now. I go to these conferences and, uh, you know, there are definitely, obviously, if you have poster presentations, you want to try to get that information out. But also, people don't want to take that information home with them, right? I've taken a lot of that stuff with me, put it in my backpack, you know, I get home and then what do you do all of a sudden, right? You throw it in the trash, unfortunately, yeah. right? Um, so I think this could be a way, I th you know, it would be kind of cool if, if QR codes took a like, a, you know, 2.0, where if there's a way, and I know they're driving back to your landing page or website, but if there's a way to kind of bookmark that to make it easier for that person, because again, if you're introducing your solution to the first time to a prospect, maybe you don't want to fill out the form, but maybe you want to go back at a later time, right? So I think there could be something in, in like trying to incorporate that into the QR code to save that page or website to go back to it later. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting to see, you know, obviously if there's any updates to the QR code, but definitely uh, the number two trend when it comes to digital um, for conference marketing. And the third tactic, let's get into it here um, for digital. It's specifically around NPI numbers, right? And we're all familiar with NPI numbers. Um, we're continuing to leverage it and it's a great way to reach your niche audience one-to-one -one before they even show up to the conference. That's why we're talking about it today. And there's a variety of different digital sources. Obviously, anybody can go down there and um, download the actual national provider identifier. It's a free database where we're helping bridge the gap for a lot of our clients, again, to warm their audience up before um, the conference is specifically around leveraging these numbers and bridging that gap when it comes to reaching the audience digitally. We can also use billing codes, CPT codes, ICD-10 codes to reach that audience. And, you know, a lot of times people aren't familiar in how it works. I just wanted to take a couple minutes just to walk you through it. So let's say, for example, you're planning for AACR, ASCO, big oncology-based conference. Um, every physician uh, by HIPAA, like, requirement, obviously, you have to have that MPI number. So again, we're taking that information. We're knowing when specifically that oncologist, medical oncologist, surgical oncologist is online. And then we can serve a banner ad to them as they navigate online. So think of it again as like your traditional lifestyle sites, new sports, weather. Once we know that they're online, we can serve that banner ad to them. And it's called programmatic. So let's say you've got you know, a poster presentation or a sponsored um, theater that you're trying to put out there. Um, again, that's a great way to start targeting them about the conference. But let's say you're trying to target them like 90 days or 120 days for the before the conference. And again, if you're an early stage startup, or even if you're fully commercialized, you've got some sort of information that you're trying to influence, right? These niche HCPs. So you definitely want to warm them up um, several months in advance, and then you can always change the creative, right? So once it gets closer to the actual conference for ACR ASCO or any other conference that you're trying to, you know, warm up this audience for, you can change the creative, push the actual conference. But the great thing about digital, when we're running these campaigns, we can obviously optimize, uh, we can change creative, we can change the landing page, uh, but it's definitely a great way to warm up, influence that audience before they show up for the big conference. And the, the cool thing about this targeting, again, it's programmatic, but it's cross device. So let's say we start uh, running you know, ads on their mobile device, it's gonna go cross device. So it's gonna go to the desktop and their laptop um, and their tablet. So it's a great way to do the cross device, influence them, educate them. Typically when we're running these types of campaigns, it's definitely all about um, education. Um, and I know Kelly, you've been heavily involved in a lot of these digital HCP one-to-one -one targeting. Um, what, what are your thoughts and how these are kind of rolling out for this year? Yeah, I, I one, <clears throat> being um, around and uh, working with digital marketing for years and years when God was a child, you know, <laughs> um, uh, it is amazing to the degree that you can really get so niche. Um, that is one part that just blows my mind even today. Um, but the part that I really love about the HCP one-to-one -one is the fact that you can then... Um, capture the people who expressed interest, who were exposed to an ad, who clicked on an ad, and then create um, a, a list of people who've already raised their hand and shown uh, warm intent. So that's, I think, really um, the powerful, really powerful part about this, other than getting so niche. Yeah, that's a great point, Kelly. And I'm going to dive into that. I just wanted to showcase specifically, just at a high level, some of the oncology and spe subspecialties we can reach. 
when it comes to medical oncology, hematology, um, you know, surgical oncology, all these different niche HCPs. Again, they've got those MPI numbers, so we can definitely target them. And the great thing about it, I think, to your point, Kelly, just to kind of piggyback off that in a little bit, is that HCP, since we have the data up front, we're running those ads, we know um, each individual HCP, right, who we're targeting. And if anybody clicks on the ad, they go back to your website, we give a month report um, to the clients to say, hey, these are the, for example, 100 medical oncologists that saw your ad, they clicked on it, they went back to your website. So it's almost like a lead gen report, right? It's a spreadsheet. Um, so you're turning those marketing qualified leads into actual sales qualified leads. And that's how marketing is winning, right? They're actually turning that report over saying, hey, you know, Jimmy, VP of sales, I've got 100 right, physicians that saw our ad and they don't have to fill out a form, right? We know specifically that they clicked on it just based on that click. And that's the that's kind of the beauty of, um, of digital, right? So who wouldn't want to report, right? every single month that said, hey, these are the most engaged physicians. So if you're early stage startup and you're trying to get right more awareness, more top of the funnel that nobody knows your name, nobody knows your solution, right? That's a great way for sales to start warming up to know like, hey, these leads, um, you know, I have, I've seen the ad, right? They saw our solution. They've been to the website and um, we get really great data. So we actually have the physical address mm -hmm. if there's some sort of hospital affiliation. So whether you have an inside sales team or you have an outside sales team, this tactic can be leveraged, right? And there's definitely unique ways beyond that as far as marketing goes to be able to, you know, re-engage these people. But what we're doing is, you know, we're recommending um, before your conferences to, to run these. Typically, these are longer term campaigns, right? Um, just, just think about if you're early stage startup and you're trying to grow the adoption of your solution, right? It doesn't happen over 30 days. It doesn't happen over six months. Usually it takes time, right? Frequency. That's the great thing about digital because you got the frequency, you're showing up at conferences. So it's a great way to intersperse. And again, going back to the original optimization of conferences, let's say you decide to skip a couple conferences. You know, this is a great solution to run um, because you're targeting your niche audience digitally, right? You may not want to go to those um, other trade shows. You may not want to spend money on the booth, right? You may not want to spend money for dinners and lunches and those sorts of things. So this is definitely a good digital alternative to, to not having to go to conferences, right, Kelly? Exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. Cool. All right. Let's, so let's pivot here. Let's put on our video hat. And if you've been waiting um, for video, this is your time right here. And I was just looking to see, and I know you're looking to Kelly, if there's any questions that pop up, but I'm going to break down or we're going to break down and talk for the last probably nine minutes. We're going to keep this at 30 minutes. So if you're looking to up your game when it comes to video, these are the top five trends um, that Kelly and I have obviously fleshed out. We've been seeing more and more of this, but the first one, uh, as you can see here on the screen, I kind of teed it up before, but um, these unique fireside chats, and I don't think it's super unique, but as I've been to these conferences, I've been noticing it more and more. And instead of having like in this picture, you can see up here on the right, it's like a podium presentation, sponsor presentation. They've got chairs up there instead of having your normal like panel discussion with the eight foot table, uh, I think people are just so used to those that they kind of, you know, like tune out. I sit in a lot of these and I see people on their phone and, you know, seeing people and I still see people engaged obviously, but I think it's a more casual, more casual, more intimate way to share your information. Again, the chairs just make people a little bit more casual, a little bit more laid back. So definitely seeing that trend. But the other trend beyond like um, the sponsor presentations is um, capturing a lot of unique footage, video footage with your key opinion leaders, but having like uh, a moderator there to help. And that's the picture to the right. And uh, we've been doing this for many years, but it's kind of gone away and kind of popped up here. And so I think it's definitely something that's going to continue to pop up more and more for 2024, but it's around, you know, creating educational content that's at, and like answering a lot of frequently asked questions that your audience has, but with a the moderator, they're like leading that conversation. And Kelly, you and I know we've cranked out a ton of videos when it comes to like talking head style, right? This seems to be more, um, again, fireside chat style, more intimate, but there's definitely a moderator and we're usually doing it in a hospitality suite right next to the conference, right? That's the advantage when you're at a conference, your key opinion leaders, they're all there. They're all one location. You can definitely take advantage of it. Um, a lot of these hospitality suites can be leveraged for a day or two and you're there and you know, you can crank out a ton of content, right? I mean, you could have 
seven to eight to 20 videos if you wanted to, right? It just depends on how many key opinion leaders you have. But Kelly, what are your thoughts on these like fireside chats? Well, it's interesting because remember when content marketing was coming big on the scene and everybody was creating tons of content, but the problem back then was it was a, uh, a quantity thing. Everybody was trying to get as many blogs as possible. And then the pendulum swang a little bit to some, you know, something that was now measurable and more, uh, more reasonable is let's not create tons of blogs. Let's create a few blogs that are good. I think the same thing is happening in the video area. Instead of checking a box and just doing a talking head that isn't very engaging, it's good. Don't get me wrong. But if you could do something that's a little more authentic, a little more engaging, where you have maybe two people up on a podium talking back and forth, maybe having and, and talking to some slides, uh, and just making it a little more interactive, I think is really where the pendulum is going. Um, the hospitality suite is another really great way to, um, you know, think about it. If you're flying in to do a conference and you stay in a hospitality suite, and then you utilize that hospitality suite for uh, interviews where you're getting good quality um, video, not in a static cold environment or on the exhibitor floor, but something where with uh, hospitality suites, we're always masterful at being able to kind of create cool sets with the um, furniture that is there as well as maybe borrowing a hallway plant or something uh, and really creating a nice little set. But I think it's much more engaging. So I think that's where I've seen um, an interesting trend where it's not creating just, you know, check the box, let's do a talking head with some slides, but instead let's make this content more engaging. Let's make it um, you know, something that's likely going to make a bigger impression and, a, and be remembered. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I love the, the concept of the backgrounds and a lot of clients already have hospitality suites, right? And not all of them, but again, think about it like cost-effective wise. Like, you know, if you've got, let's say five of your key opinion leaders there at that conference, what would you rather do, right? Fly us to five different locations, travel costs for each individual one, try to figure out where to scope out this project from a visual standpoint, right? Where this is easy, right? You don't have to fly five different places. It's one, one, diff one place, obviously. And then we're just rotating KOLs in, right? It's like, you've got your moderator, right? This doctor is going to be here. And it's not a big time commitment. Um, like usually they're in the chair. Um, we just got back from a shoot um, just a couple days ago where the person, like he was the CEO, he was a rock star. He did his bit in like 20 minutes, right? Not everybody can do it. But if you're trying to maximize the time, because I know we get a lot of clients that say, hey, I'm trying to coordinate this. Like, do we need a two hours or how much time do we need with that physician, right? This is our key opinion leader. They're jammed with their, their, their calendars. There's so much going on. Hey, we can crank it out usually in 20 minutes, right? Sometimes if they want to sit in the chair longer, we definitely have that opportunity, but usually it's pretty quick, right? It's about 20 minutes. So um, it's a great cost-effective way to obviously do that. And the other unique thing I wanted to spin on this and kind of going rogue a little bit here, Kelly, just so you know, um, I know it's focused on uh, video, but um, what we've been doing more and more on is capturing the audio of this. So a lot of times when we do these longer form content conversations, these fireside chats, because these aren't the normal like two to three minute, right? Conversations. This is a fireside chat. So it's a little bit longer form content, not like you know, an hour form content, but it's like, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Well, what we're doing, the strategy is to extract the audio. And a lot of clients, what they're doing is with the audio is launching a podcast. So they can leverage that long form video, obviously for their website, um, for YouTube and all the other channels that they're pushing out there. But you can actually extract that audio piece and, you know, uh, start launch your podcast because I've seen a lot of trends when it comes to um, obviously physicians, they, they're they going back to traveling af obviously after the pandemic and they're educating themselves when they're driving to right the clinic or driving to the hospital or maybe they're traveling to that conference, right? And they want to get some good information via podcast. That's something to kind of think about. Sorry, Kelly, I went rogue there with audio. No, no, no. It's, it, that's a great point. But uh, the other thing is these hospitality suites can truly be kind, kind of become a studio. And um, to uh, Jason's point, if it's something like ASCO where you've got a high number of KOLs or um, you, you can crank out a ton of really great thought leadership um, content. And I know in uh, conferences past, we literally have had a hair and makeup person there and we have like every 30 minutes, somebody scheduled and it works out beautifully. We have, you know, like little snacks and things for them to kind of, you know, play a little like the little bit of the green room. And you really can take hospitality suite and literally 
crank out, you know, have, you know, five or six different KOLs come in and you have a ton of really excellent content that you've been able to capture and create very cost effectively. Yep. Great point, Kelly. Let's get into the number two video conference trend. And uh, I've been taking pictures of this uh, a lot last year, but I started to see this trend a little bit earlier too. Um, and it's kind of cool because essentially it's turning a company into a media company. And we all have heard that you know, coin, obviously you need to create, you know, and you mentioned that here too, Kelly is like, you need to crank out a bunch of content. Well, this is definitely uh, a great way to do it. So, you know, if you're designing a booth or if you're in the process, you know, think about um, literally carving out a space for an in booth studio or like a media center. And you can see up here on the picture, up here on the screen, there's a couple different pictures. Uh, it's great. You've got a TV in the background. Obviously, you've got video. You can capture audio of this too if you wanted to turn it into a podcast. But it's a great way to either present information versus trying to do maybe a product theater and spend right 50 or 100 grand. Maybe you create the space inside your booth, right? It's going to drive booth traffic. The other great thing about this too is again, it is a media center, right? You're cranking out a bunch of content. So maybe it's something you're not um, broadcasting, right? Maybe it's just something where you're there, you've got this area, your key opinion leaders are coming in. Maybe it's your subject matter experts. Maybe it's your leadership, right? Maybe they've got some big announcement, right? That they want the leadership to come into. So it's a great, um, great way to do it. And I think I've got another picture here. Yeah, I just included this one this morning. So this is another great um, area too. I mean, this is a little bit larger space, but nice and intimate. Um, it's got the branding, obviously. Uh, audio's captured really well through this. So there's definitely a couple of unique opportunities and ways that you can uh, do that. And I know, Kelly, you've seen several of these too at the conferences. Yeah, the icing on the cake is, you know, you do create some nice buzz on the exhibitor floor. Um, and um, additionally, you're kind of positioning yourself as the thought leader. <laughs> Uh, when you they see that you have like a whole infrastructure set up and you're capturing uh, content like that, it's just kind of a nice a nice little layer of extra benefit. Yeah, yeah, I know I'm biased and I'm a video person, so every time I've walked by these things, I've just stopped naturally to be like, "Hey, what are they talking about here? Like, uh -huh. this is so cool." Um, <laughs> and it's like an alternative. Like I mentioned, let's say um, you don't want to do the product theater, right, or you don't want to invest in that. It's a great way to carve out that space inside your booth, and not everybody has a big budget to be able to do this inside your booth. So a lot of times when we're executing some of these, we're just there inside the booth, obviously. So we're capturing a lot of things with key opinion leaders, subject matter experts and leadership teams. So let's say, you know, you've just redesigned your booth and you don't have this space in it, but you still want to get a lot of content. Like if you're, you know, if you're, putting out data and you want some sort of like reaction videos, well, we can still get in the booth area. I know last year when we were at ASCO, we, there's a couple clients that just didn't have big booths, right? They had like a 10 by 10 booth and we still were able to capture a lot of good content. So obviously if you have the budget to do something like this, when it comes to a studio or a media center, it's a cool way to capture that. Like here's that second picture too. Um, but if you don't right, there's alternatives for that too. And let's get into it. I know we're at 31 minutes already and I know I lied already and said, Hey, we're going to probably do this in 30 minutes. So, um, we've got three more, I know we got three more videos, um, trends. And the next one is about poster videos. And we've all seen poster presentations and we've all been to the conferences and you go down the poster section and, you know, there's like a million different posters, right? Um, so how do you stand out? So one of the things that we continue to see is trends for this year and started obviously last year too, but um, animating your posters, meaning like highlighting your posters, the way I think about it, it's almost like a, you know, a movie trailer, right? With, with so many different posters, being um, released and data and abstracts, you know, a great way to drive eyeballs and hack someone's attention would be to create a shorter, like two to three minute motion graphics animation style poster. And it's really just a summary, right? Um, I think that's going to help spoon feed kind of your audience to learn more about your data. And obviously, if you do a highlight that's a couple minutes and now they're kind of engaged and they want to learn more, well, they can go to your massive poster, right? And learn more about it. But it's definitely a great way that you can showcase on your event landing page. Uh, maybe it's something obviously you put on social too, but it's a great way to, again, really hack the attention of that person because you can only learn so much, right? When you're at these conferences and Kelly, I know you've been a part of a lot of different animation videos for posters. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, there's the interesting thing. There's so many different ways you can um, put this onto video. And, you know, it's like one of the first marketing principles, make it easy for your audience to consume the content. And the posters and the abstracts that you see are not easy. Um, it's a lot of information. It um, has limited distribution. So why not take and create a short video that really highlights the key, the key highlights and stats for it? Maybe even have your principal inv uh, investigator speak to it, and then that way your sales team and marketing team can get it out on a much more broader scale um, that's going to be consumed and retained better. So it just seems like a no-brainer to me. Yep, agree. Uh, so let's crank out these last two. Uh, so the last two specifically, hey, we're actually doing it right now. It's live streaming and we continue <laughs> to do it. Um, and, I, and I see this as a trend. So the context of this one is let's say you have a sponsor presentation, you have a product theater, you have an industry expert theater, you have a lunch and learn, right? They're called five different things, but you spend a lot of money. Sometimes they're 50 grand, sometimes they're a hundred thousand, right? So if you can expand your audience outside of that product theater, that sponsored theater doing a live stream, it's a great uh, way to do it and broadcast it to much more people. So for example, we did this towards the latter part of last year and we had more people watching it online through the live stream that versus that was actually there in the actual product theater. And um, live streaming has been around for many, many years. And it's a great way to, again, expand your audience online. So the, one of our clients, uh, we talked through the strategy a little bit more and we actually recommended and they obviously agreed to, to share that live link with their sales team. And then the sales team is going to share it with the people, the positions that maybe couldn't attend. Right. So it's a great way to, again, build that audience online and expand that exposure um, besides the besides the product theater, obviously. And, you know, we do a good job in vetting that with the conference ahead of time. We want to get approvals. Some conferences are a little bit more closed and they won't let us do the live stream, but a majority of them uh, will do the live stream. And, you know, obviously with the some some of them have the online platform to do that, too. So it just really kind of depends. And we definitely want to navigate those waters ahead of time. But what are you seeing for live stream events for this year, Kelly? You know, it's this is another one that just seems like a no brainer, especially the you know, the crazy prices, if you see what, um, you know, one of these product theater goes for at ASCO, you know, it's kind of a no brainer. Why wouldn't you spend a little more money to really make sure you're broadcasting it? And I think kind of some of the things that we've seen that really propelled the success is, you know, a lot of pre-planning just don't show up in live stream. You want to do planning and get your salespeople to get those links out there because you can get an amazing amount of additional people who are able to view it. And then, um, once again, icing on the cake, you now have a recorded version that you can push out uh, post-conference and to people who weren't able to go to uh, that conference. Yep, agreed. Let's crank out this last one real quick, Kelly. It sounds like your dog needs to go outside. So let's um, get into this one. It's the interactive videos. And I know you've seen it on conferences. I've seen it. We've cranked out some uh, conference videos um, for clients in this. And the way I kind of look at it, and you probably do too, it's almost like a choose your own adventure, right? So if it's a prospect walking up to your booth, again, maybe there's some hesitation to talk to the salesperson. Or what I've seen a lot of times is a salesperson is gravitating towards these interactive displays and walking that prospect through their solution. And the cool thing about these interactive displays is that again, it's like choose your own adventure. So if you want to learn about you know, the data, if you want to learn about that solution or you know, how it works, I've seen a lot of these interactive touch screens, specifically you touch on something and it maybe like a how-to video pops up, right? It's more like motion graphics and animation. Uh, sometimes there's a PDF that you can actually download. So you can actually put your email address in there where it actually emails. Or again, it's almost like a demo, right? So that salesperson, that, that prospect walks up and they can just kind of walk him through. And it's um, it's kind of getting away from, the, again, the print brochures, those sorts of things to be more interactive and more kind of choose your own adventure. Uh, Kelly, what are your thoughts on these interactive videos? Well, it's funny. I think about the stat out there, 75 to 80% of um, potential customers uh, actually do a lot of their online market research before even talking to a salesperson. I think that goes line in line with that or uh, aligns with that particular stat. Um, the fact that somebody really would like to kind of drive their own adventure. Um, and then people want to control that, that adventure. You know, while we're talking about adventures, they want to be the one to really decide what information they're getting, when they're getting it and how they're getting it. So I think this kind of um, checks off both boxes. Yes, agreed a thousand percent. So 
Thanks everyone for joining, attending. I know we cranked out eight different trends and uh, hopefully as you plan out your strategies for conferences for this year and potentially even next year, this has been valuable, helpful information.